Hello, and welcome to the first video in a new series I'll be calling Practical Electronics 101. Since I'll be doing videos on projects that involve electronics, I thought it would be a good idea to also do a series of videos that focuses on the theory side of circuits, and go over the concepts that you'd find in an intro course at a university or community college. This should help everyone get up to speed on the relevant concepts that I'll be talking about in my projects, since not everyone has taken a class in circuits before. For today's video, we'll be starting with the basics and we'll be going over concepts such as voltage, current, power sources, and the difference between direct current and alternating current. The next video in this series will talk about passive components such as resistors, capacitors, inductors, and how to use a multimeter to do basic readings. The third video will talk about transistors and relays, and how to use them. And at that point, we'll be ready to apply this knowledge to an actual project that incorporates a microcontroller, or SBC, which will allow us to control the circuits we build. The reason why I'm calling this series Practical Electronics is because everything I talk about will be geared towards using this knowledge for real projects. I believe the hands-on aspect, in addition to the theory, is important when learning new concepts like this. Keep in mind that electronics is a very vast and complex subject, so I'll be focusing on the basics at first and give just enough info to get started on some practical projects. And then in later videos, I'll go into more in-depth on the theory as we do more advanced projects. So with that said, let's get started on some basic theory. This equation is called Ohm's Law, and it's the most fundamental equation when it comes to electronics. It gives the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Now most intro to electronics classes start off by using water as an analogy for an electrical current. I'll also be using the water analogy as well. However, before I talk about that, I think it'll actually be better to really hammer home this concept first. The importance of how you think about current, voltage, and resistance in relation to each other. While these are three separate values, it's really important to understand that they're three parts making up a single thing. More specifically, a single circuit. A circuit must have all three of these components, and changing one of them has an effect on the others. Designing a basic circuit is basically just a game of balancing out its voltage, current, and resistance. Usually at least one of these things will be given, and won't change. So as an example, let's say the resistance is set to 8 ohms. Now let's say we wanted to find out the current at a given voltage. If we set the voltage to 12, then we can calculate what the current would be in that circuit. It would be 1.5 amps. Now, if we ran the same circuit at 9 volts instead, we'll see that the current changes accordingly and would be 1.125 amps in that case. But you're probably wondering, what exactly is voltage, current, and resistance? Well, let's now use the classic water analogy to illustrate it. Let's imagine the electrical current flowing in a circuit is actually a pipe with water in it. The rate at which the water flows through the pipe is determined by the amount of pressure that's pushing the water through the pipe. The pressure that's pushing the water is analogous to voltage in an electrical circuit. Another term for voltage is potential difference, since it's the difference in charge between two points that creates this force. When charged particles such as electrons flow through an object, they create an electrical current that actually flows in the opposite direction than what the electrons are, which might seem counterintuitive at first, but it's something you'll just need to accept for now, since the physics behind electromagnetism is a whole different can of worms. So let's focus on circuits and get back to the water analogy. Let's now consider the size of the water pipe. If we were to replace this pipe with one that has a larger circumference, this would allow more water to flow through it. The size of the pipe and the volume of water flowing through it is analogous to the current, which is expressed in the unit of amps. So let's say you have two pipes of different sizes with water flowing through them at the same speed. 
Obviously, the larger pipe will allow for more volume of water to flow, even though the water is flowing at the same speed in both of them. But it also means you have to deal with more water in general, which is harder to manage. The smaller pipe is easier to work with. But what's the point of these water pipes unless they're able to accomplish something for us? That's where resistance comes in, which allows us to convert this energy into work that actually does something for us. So let's imagine we install a water mill in our pipe network so the water flows through the water mill's wheel and converts this energy into a mechanical process which drives some sort of machinery that does work for us. In an electrical circuit, this would be called the load. For example, the load could be a computer, or it could be the motor in a power drill, or it could be a light bulb, or countless other things that are powered by electricity. All these loads do some sort of work for us and require electricity to do that work. Every load will also have a particular resistance value to it. It's called resistance because it resists the flow of current or essentially slows it down in order to transfer that energy into useful work. Let's now go back to our water mill analogy to expand on this. So like I just said, the stream of water pushes the wheel in our water mill and this energy gets converted into a mechanical process that does work for us. But doing this also slows down the stream of water that pushes the wheel. As the water passes around the loop, it loses energy each time it hits the wheel. So in order to keep the stream of water moving, we could add a pump here that will ensure the water keeps moving at a consistent pressure and speed. The water pump is considered the power source in this analogy. In an electrical circuit, the power source can be a number of different things including a battery or a power supply. Most power supplies are voltage regulated, meaning they will provide a consistent voltage to the circuit and will supply whatever current the circuit requires, as long as the required current doesn't exceed the power supply's rated capacity. Now everything I've been talking about with the water analogy up until now has assumed we were using direct current. AC stands for alternating current and it's what runs through the power lines over long distances and into our homes through the power outlets. And this is where the water analogy starts to fall apart and doesn't really apply anymore. Instead of direct current where the current continuously flows in the same direction, Alternating current will actually change direction each time it reaches the power source and will continue to bounce back and forth at a specific frequency. In the United States and certain parts of the world, power outlets operate at a frequency of 60 Hz, which means the current will travel back and forth 60 times per second. In Europe and other parts of the world, alternating current operates at 50 Hz instead of 60. The voltage can also vary depending on where you live, but that's besides the point right now. Most of the devices in our homes require a power supply that converts the alternating current from the outlet into direct current that can be used by common electronics. Battery powered devices do not require AC to DC conversion because batteries are a DC power source to begin with. However, not everything requires direct current. Some devices are designed to run straight off alternating current. Some examples are fluorescent and incandescent light bulbs, air conditioners, AC motors which can be found in things such as fans and wired power drills, and a few other items and appliances. But like I said, the majority of devices in your home operate on DC and require a power supply to do this conversion. Also, something to keep in mind is that audio is considered to be an AC signal as well. But I'll be talking more about audio in future videos and projects. Now the last thing I wanted to briefly talk about today is how to calculate the power consumption of a device which can be determined by this equation. Power is the product of voltage times current and is measured in the unit of watts. Using Ohm's law and rearranging that equation allows us to represent power in a few other ways too, which is useful depending on which information you already know about your circuit. Let's just do a simple example right now using a light bulb. 
If we know our light bulb is a 60 watt bulb and we connect it to a standard 120 volt outlet, how much current does the light bulb draw? Well, all we need to do is plug in the values we know and we can solve for the current, which comes out to half an amp. But keep in mind that power is not the same thing as energy. Power only tells us how much energy a device is using at a given instance, but the amount of time the device is left on will determine how much energy it uses overall, and the power can fluctuate over time as well. That's why your electric bill isn't given in the unit of kilowatts, but rather in the unit of kilowatt hours. This is expressed by this equation where T stands for time. When we incorporate time into the equation, that's when advanced math such as calculus and differential equations start to become important when solving more advanced problems. Frequency is also directly related to time and is another important concept in electronics that I briefly mentioned before when talking about alternating current and audio. This is just something to keep in mind, and it's not necessary to know calculus for the basic projects I'll be starting out with, but it's a topic I'll return to later down the road once I start demonstrating more advanced projects that require it. Well that wraps up today's video. If you learned something then be sure to give the video a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon so you can get notified when new videos come out. The next one in this series will go over passive components such as resistors and capacitors, and I'll also be showing how to use the various functions on a multimeter to do readings. But that's all for today's video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.